Hi folks, this is Dr. Robert Sivers, the Carb Addiction Doc, back with some more insights uh, that we've gained in our practice managing people with addictive behavior. And yes, carbohydrates are a highly addictive drug. They no longer, they no longer have a place in our food system for most people. So along those lines, one of the things that we see um, both up front when we're dealing with untreated addicts, as well as in the evolution of change as people come to terms with their addiction, are a spectrum of disruptive behaviors. Remember, addiction is really a disruptive behavior to ourselves. It is where we tolerate harm to ourselves from the substance of the behavior for an upfront reward, for an upfront high that we get. And we're so focused on that high that we're immune to even thinking about the consequences downstream. Addicts are immune to risk. And I know that's a difficult concept to understand, but we need that high so much right now that we're willing to harm ourselves and perhaps tell ourselves it won't happen or we'll deal with it down the road. You know, when you roll up your sleeve and put a tourniquet on your arm and heat up some powder in a spoon and eject heroin into your veins, you're not thinking about turning blue and dying. You're thinking about the high exclusively. So in this conversation about the spectrum of disruptive behaviors, one of the things to understand is that when we don't have effective ways to deal with emotional tension, not only do we turn that harm inward with addictive behavior, we also turn our response to anxiety, our reaction to anxiety and distress outwardly to the people around us, often to the people we most love. And one of the things that I look for in the people that I talk to up front, and, and they're usually very well behaved when they first come in, uh, there's a degree of assumed respect, but we reveal certain behavior patterns. And I look for certain streams that are inherent to addictive behavior. And that is either pure aggression, which is where you've got this facade and you just want people to bounce off it, a very aggressive uh, um, facade. And especially once people's guards are down, that aggression really reveals themselves. And how do we see uh, aggression? Controlled anger. Little angry outbursts and you catch yourself and, and have a little bit of remorse and you pull it back. But angry outbursts. And sometimes they can be very subtle. We're very smart at camouflaging our aggressive behavior. But angry outbursts, profane, disrespectful language. When you use derogatory language about somebody, whether in the current climate it's racism or whatever that may be, but it's little subtle or sometimes not so subtle daggers, darts that we throw at people, profane and disrespectful language, where there's an absence of empathy for who the other person might be at all. Certainly, stomping your feet, throwing things, you can see what my hand is doing, that's aggression. Throwing things, yelling, screaming, stomping your feet, slamming doors, kicking the cat, those are all forms of obvious aggression. But so is demeaning behavior. When you demean people, especially people that you love the most, that is you not being able to handle your own emotional tension. You're not able to handle your own anxiety and stress and frustration and anger and fear and sadness and boredom and pleasure. And you demean other people. It is not socially acceptable anymore. It used to be. It used to be, but it's no longer socially acceptable. And obviously physical aggression. One of the things we're seeing now with the COVID lockdown is more and more spousal abuse, where someone can't contain their anger. And it's not always husband against wife. It's often as well wife against husband or wife against kids or against animals in the house. But physical aggression, where you can't help yourself but be abusive. And here's something that's interesting. Under the caption of aggressive behavior are sexual comments, sexual harassment, and sexual aggression. In other words, you're not aware of how the other person feels. You may say something, and you might think, ha-ha, it's funny, you've got to have a thick skin. But ultimately, what you don't do is recognize 
how that may harm somebody else. Now, everybody sometimes makes little mistakes where they hurt somebody and it's an interplay. But when it's a pattern, when it takes on a continuous form of thought and a continuous execution on that thought, then you're using sexual comments, sexual harassment, and sexual behavior in an aggressive way, not a sexual way. Sex is critically important, and sexual contact is critically important to the preservation of the species. But when it is used in a controlling or aggressive way, that becomes a concern. Then it is no longer about procreation. It's about aggression. And that includes racial and ethnical jokes. Now, our society has become less and less tolerant of those. So we keep them inside. But it's still a form of aggression. And aggressive behavior ultimately, and this is what, what folks don't understand out there as we deal with uh, uh, racial tension and everything else, is that that is a form of tolerable and now intolerable aggression. That is a form of dysfunctional emotional management that ultimately comes from how we were raised. And not raised to be racist or raised to be sexual harassers, but raised without effective emotion coping skills. Without ways to step back and respond to our own emotions rather than step into the emotion and react. So aggression takes a variety of different forms. And, and can society go over the top with this? Of course it can. There is a role for aggressive behavior from time to time, but never as a pattern, as a way of life. That's a problem. That is a problem. Now, on the flip side of that, I see people who are passive. I see people who are mushy, who cannot generate a response to anything. However, that passiv passivity may be ignored because people are not viewed as a threat when they're passive. They're just there, but you don't even notice them. They're part of the furniture, part of the environment. They pose no threat. So we often ignore or don't acknowledge their presence. However, the per passive personality type is as bad for that person as the aggressive personality type. Aggression harms other people. And that's why they react to aggression in a, in a negative way. But passivity harms you equally. And how do we, how do we see passivity? Well, yeah, it's pretty obvious when someone's unable to formulate opinion. They're always afraid of saying something that might hurt somebody else. They're overly afraid. However, the other places we see passivity is in people who are chronically late. People who are chronically late, that's passivity. But they're not saying it. Or not responding to calls. Not responding and, and maybe taking a little while to process stuff, but not responding at all. That's passivity. And more and more, our business systems have begun to do that. They don't respond to people's concerns in case they upset you. So it's better not to respond than to upset somebody. But then we lose the ability for dialogue. We lose the ability to help people to move forward and understand social interaction. So not responding to calls, not responding to things. Now, do you have to respond to every little thing? No. No, you don't. But at the same time, there's discretion. And when non-responding becomes a pattern, that becomes a problem for the person and the same thing for the institution. So when we're talking about the spectrum of disruptive behaviors, they can, they can apply to people but they also apply to institutions and they apply to systems. Another form of passivity is when you slow down in your work, when you don't do new things, when you do just what you're supposed to do. You're not innovative, you're not thinking ahead. When you slow things down on purpose or intentionally, when you take your time, that is passive. Giving people a cold shoulder. Giving people the cold shoulder is a passive way of not interacting with people when there's emotional tension involved. So on one hand, we step in and react 
to emotional tension on the aggressive side. On the other side, the passive side is disengagement, non-engagement, and using passive maneuvers to avoid dealing with our emotional triggers. And then the most difficult one to really quantify is passive-aggressive. Passive-aggressive is where we're nice, but there's this subtle undercurrent. There may be subtle derogatory comments about others when it would have been best to keep your mouth shut or look for the good in somebody rather than always the negative. So it's not profane language or disrespect as in anger, but it's derogatory comments. It's maybe refusing to do tasks that you're supposed to do. Not being the yes person for everything, but refusing to do certain things. Not my job. Instead of, how can I help if I can? If I can't help, that's fine. So the passive person never tries to help. The aggressive person is always angry about helping. And the passive aggressive person just subtly doesn't do things. Sarcasm is passive aggressive. My, my saying always used to be uh, that sarcasm is the lowest, the lowest form of wit, but it is still a form of wit. And that's fine from time to time, but if sarcasm is a pattern, it hurts the people around you, and therefore it ends up hurting you. Writing inappropriate things, writing things that are harmful, and implied threats. Passive-aggressive people navigate life fairly well, but ultimately they can't engage. They're not as obvious as aggressive people, and they're not as ignored as the passive people, but they still navigate their emotional needs through negativity. So what is the right way to be? And, and, and very often what we see is people from either passive or aggressive switch over to being passive aggressive as they go through a continuum of change. So be aware of those three categories. However, what we human beings should strive for when we have a robust, effective emotion management system, that we do things for ourselves and for others that calm our emotions down and help us to identify and process through the issues that are driving our emotions and where we can have unconditional pride in what we're doing. Because all of those behaviors have conditional elements to them. They make me feel better, but they hurt other people. Or they may hurt us. So uh, in an assertive family background or in, a, in a, uh, an assertive person, an assertive person values kindness and gratitude above all else. An assertive person asks, okay, how does this make me feel and how will my response make somebody else feel? There's an empathy. There's, there's a way to step back, figure out how you feel, understand what made you feel that way, and then respond in a way that you are not reacting to your feelings, that immediate evisceration or withdrawal or sarcastic behavior, but instead you are sweeping aside the emotion and figuring out what the real issue is. And also understanding is now the time to really respond to that issue. And then the response should mostly be factual, but taking into account the other person. Kindness and gratitude, how did it make me feel, and how do I feel? It's about, it's about loving what you do and who you are, rather than loving what you achieve through your behavior. And being assertive is unconditional. It's something that you need to be able to represent under any circumstance. Don't be easily offended but don't be oblivious to other people's feelings. And regularly debrief yourself. We're not perfect, we're human. But if we have an introspective debriefing period, where perhaps we go for a walk, or we go away and sip on a cup of coffee, have that little mind-cleansing moment, where we can debrief what just happened, and be analytical of that, and say, okay, I did really well, or how can I do better the next time? 
Displaying emotional intelligence is what being assertive is all about. Being aware of yourself and aware of other people, not just what you're saying, but your body language, and the need to say something at a particular time. What you want is compassion and also to be somebody that's predictable in how you deal with your emotions. The aggressive person is unpredictable. The passive person is never there. Assertive people can be trusted in terms of how they're going to respond to stuff. Understand the emotional overlay on the facts. Have techniques, have principles, have ways to dissipate the emotional tension by something you do so that you can identify and deal with a fact. We hear this word mindfulness all the time. Mindfulness is paying attention to the present using all five and maybe all six of your senses. And when you are aware of how you feel and your impact on others, you can then have the best response. So strive to be assertive, but you can only be assertive as you build up self-esteem and self-confidence. And the way you build up self-esteem and self-confidence is in tiny little increments by doing things that you're proud of and having moments where you can debrief, think about what happened and ask yourself, was I kind or unkind? Was I grateful or ungrateful? Dealing with those interpersonal issues and dealing with issues within yourself is so important to being assertive. Are you ever going to get there? No. We are all students of human behavior. We are students of how to be acceptably aggressive, how to be acceptably passive or passive aggressive, or how we can improve our lot in life personally and in our society and with our friends by being assertive. If this video made you think I've done my job, Thanks for watching.